Welcome to the Your Story is Our Story podcast, brought to you by the new 3Rs.org, which is dedicated to telling the social justice stories of yesterday and today. My name is Neil Foote, host of this podcast, where we will have honest, heartfelt, and heart-wrenching conversations about race and culture in our communities. This podcast is our simple way of helping you to join us in our mission, which simply says, by using stories of social justice to dismantle racism, the new three R's unlock civic and compassionate leadership at school, at home, and at work. We offer programs and resources to educate and empower children, parents, educators, and workplace leaders through a lens of racial justice and racial awareness. The new three R's educates and empowers through the art of social justice storytelling, building relationships, and fostering a sense of responsibility. We are creating a more civic and compassionate society, one child at a time. Thanks for joining us today, and remember to follow us on social at The New Three R's. That's The New, N-E-W, the number three R's. Welcome to our continuing series, Discussing Moral Responsibility in the Public School System. In this episode, our two students, Jasper Anthony and Sine Chawla, and their mentors, Camille Casaretti and Shino Tanikoa, explain how all students need to keep open minds to new experiences and embrace the importance of race, culture, diversity, and equity in our societies. We'll wrap up the episode with a Black History fact from our very own Dan Gore Sr. Let's get into the conversation. Uh, there was a, a, a letter one of uh, your classmates uh, wrote, uh, and I just want to uh, read an excerpt of it uh, in Jasmine Sune, and I'd love to get uh, some reaction to you. And uh, it, it's, it read in part, 2020 has been a sad year, COVID making us quarantine and the Black Lives Matter protests sparked once more because of the death of George Floyd. Even iconic and historic changing events of the, of the passing of Black America's superheroes, John Lewis and Chadwick Boseman has made this truly a depressing year. For me, this class has taught me things about my country and allowed me to say what I am thinking about racism and learn all the great things Black people have given America and their sacrifices. The new three R's gives me hope and strength, and for that, I'm grateful. So now, how do you react to that uh, that comment uh, and that statement, which is, is so insightful? Yeah, first of all, that's an incredibly powerful statement and, and very well said. Um, truly, that the new three R's is, I think, a very uh, large beacon of hope for for all of us. Um, and it really, it really helps us empathize going back to your last question. And I think that empathy is one of the, the most important tools in, in solving a problem. And in a problem this uh, large and this great and this embedded into our society, uh, we have to learn how it feels before we can try and find a solution. Because if you're... Um, a plumber working on an electric bulb, why would you kind of help anything, right? You wouldn't get anywhere. So we need to learn as a country with organizations like the three R's, how exactly um, others are feeling like Jasper was saying. Um, and like the excerpt was also saying, uh, the, the new three R's is, is teaching us so much about our country as well. Um, and there's just a whole nother side that uh, the new three R's has given me, which is not just that there's black history now, but hey, if there's so much untapped knowledge that I didn't know about for the last, what, 14 years of my life, how much more is there? How much more is there for me to learn? And I think that has sparked some sort of curiosity in me or some sort of hunger in me for for more um almost that hey so if this is one story i wonder how somebody else would tell it i wonder how a black person would tell it i wonder how a latinx person would tell it and i'd like to think that the new three r's like the excerpt saying uh made me a more open-minded individual 
uh, because I do think now I try to empathize more. And I think I can empathize a little bit more than I could maybe two or three years ago. Um, and that is very powerful, at least for me. And that's very powerful change because once I empathize, I feel like I can truly become part of the fight towards active anti-racism. I really think I can contribute both to my community, my class, uh, to my friends, my family, but I can't do that without organizations like the three R's. Uh, and, and I'm curious, Sine, I mean, you know, through the course of your day, how often do you have to, do you get this question of, so where are you from? <laughs> what, what's that name? How do you pronounce your name? What's that experience like and how do you, you uh, have you gotten used to it and how do you kind of, how do you kind of begin to tell your story to people who, you know, are somewhat curious, but sometimes those questions come out as, why are you asking me where I'm from? Uh, you, do you ask anyone else? So to, to tell us a little bit about that experience. So um, living in, in New York City, it seems like everybody has a different story, of course. Um, and so, yes, there are, you know, towards the beginning of the year, there are the questions, hey, where are you from? Where are uh, your father from? And then there's this question um, that somebody asked me once, I, I don't recall whether it was in fifth grade or sixth grade, somebody asked me, where are you really from? And I was like, what? And uh, I am born in the United States. I lived here for two years. Um, and then I lived in India for seven. I moved back in 2016. Um, so I have a little bit of an Indian accent. And so I could see clearly that there was some sort of, um, I guess, ulterior motive behind that question. Because when they asked me, where are you from? I said, hey, so I'm from the United States, but I identify more as Indian. And they're like, wait, but where are you really from? Like I was hiding something um, in my past that I didn't want to tell them. And so I think I begin to tell my story um, from my time in, in India, mainly because, first of all, I don't remember much of my time in the U.S., but I do feel like uh, my life truly started um, and my current relationships and who I am was shaped mostly because of that seven years. And uh, going to your question about, you know, how that makes me feel, I didn't think much of it at first um, because, hey, you know, I didn't have experience with questions like that. Nobody asks questions like that if, you know, you're in India or really I haven't had that experience anywhere else. Um, so when, when people ask me that question, I like to think that they have the best intentions possible. But Sometimes when that's not true, I tend to be a little bit um, blindsided to that reality. Uh, and I reflect later, I wonder, hmm, what was those intentions? And again, I'd like to think they're, they're good intentions and they really are wondering where I'm from and they're wondering what my story is. But I think the fact that I have to grapple with whether those intentions are true or not is something that needs to change in our society because 12 year olds and 13 year olds should not be thinking that on a daily basis. Yeah, that, thanks for answering that question. And and Jasper, I wanted to bounce to you a little bit to react to uh, the letter from uh, your classmate Donovan and a little bit about your own experience of, of having conversations with students. Uh, I'm sure, again, as you said, you have Latinx students and others and, and about their their cultural experiences and how you, you, uh, you, you share your experiences to make that greater bond with them. Well, you know, like Sune said, um, Donovan's letter is 
very, very powerful. It's, um, he said something very similar in class once, and, um, you know, I can't remember, I, I got very emotional after he said it, because he was basically describing what it was like to be a black boy, and, um, you know, it really, it really hit me hard because I realized his life was a lot more different than mine. It was a lot, you know, it, I personally don't know if it was harder or not. I, it, to me, it sounded harder because he had to deal with all that judgment, you know, people, people at a glance see him do something they would assume he's up to no good because i don't know that's a that's a cultural that's a cultural thing it's i and it really needs to change it really needs to change because like if i did that same thing no one would think anything of it so i don't know it's it's just so messed up how our society is and i believe donovan really really made a very powerful very punctual very effective efficient message with that with that um what would you call it a ex excerpt something like yeah um but uh, that's kind of what I have to say about that. And to your other question, uh, what was your experience with talking to other students? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was in talking to Sune about his kind of life experience and for you in, in relating to others who are different cultures, you know, how do you bridge that gap? How do you, you know, try to feel comfortable with people who may be uncomfortable with you and vice versa? What's, what's your approach to getting yeah, in those conversations? Well, the way I made most of my connections in elementary school was more of, it wasn't me going up to every single person asking them if we wanted to be friends, right? Because I wasn't that kind of person. Um, I was very friendly and things, you know, friends came naturally to me but my strategy was a lot more I talked to this person they're friends with these people if I'm friends with them I might be able to be friends with them so then I not only have one friend I have three so it because the more similar you are to someone the more relatable you are, the faster friendships can, not will, can develop. So I'll tell you, most of my friends um, in grade school and still now are white because that's because my best friend was uh, both of them. And I met them in preschool and they were both white because I went to a majority white preschool. And then, so one of them was a year older than me. So I, I didn't really get to meet his friends. And so that, that kind of helps because if there's someone more, more charismatic than you, who can talk to people better than you know, if you're friends with them, they can introduce you to their friends. And then you don't you don't have to be putting in all that extra work. So then, then once you're good friends with them, then you can talk about those uncomfortable situations with them faster. So it's, I don't know, it's, that was my personal strategy for making friends. And now I kind of can apply that to um, teaching people about, uh, you know, 
trying to change our entire society because it is messed up. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm more encouraged in talking to you and Sine and to know that you all are out there really, uh, you know, truly on the front lines, helping to change the conversations and helping to change the attitudes of your peers in so many different ways that I think has, to me, a cascading uh, influence uh, in, in these conversations as we look to the future. I want to uh, take a moment and, and kind of bring in our, our mentor moms into the conversation and, and initially try to get some some reaction to some of the uh, of the comments we've heard from uh, our students and and she you know um, I, I saw both you and Camille nodding your heads as they were talking and, and listening so intently she you know what do what what do you hear in the words that they say and what do you think as as you hear them oh my goodness there are just so many different things going through my head um, but I want to start with this immense feeling I have of gratitude and hope for Sune and Jasper. Because I don't know too many people my age that I interact with who can articulate the things that you both just shared with us. So you two are light years ahead of grown-ups of my generation, particularly the privileged ones. So Thank you for doing what you do. I, I'm really, really grateful. At the same time, I feel pain because I am seeing how racism and the structural racism and the systems of oppression really dehumanize all of us. White people, black people, brown people, Asian people, all people are dehumanized by the system that we have in place in this country. I hear the pain in Jasper's voice in seeing this system for what it is. I see the pain in Sine having to explain where he's from. And Sine, I have to say, intent doesn't matter. The fact that people ask you, but not people who are white, that's proof enough that they're asking you that question of where are you from is rooted in racism. They may be genuinely curious, but they have to stop to think, why is it that they pick you to ask where you're from, but likely not Jasper or Camille? I get that all the time. And as a former English language learner who is an affluent immigrant, I used to say, yes, I'm from Japan. But then after I hit that point where I'd spent more time in this country than I did in my home country, that's when I started to think, well, how long do I have to live here for people to stop asking me that freaking question? That's when I started to think, okay, you know what? This feels wrong to me. And if it feels wrong, then it probably is wrong. Trust your instinct. And yes, I'm not saying label those people evil, but let's call it what it is. It is othering and othering is a form of racism. And it might just be an opportunity for you to educate somebody if you feel comfortable enough to say, Hey, I was born here. I grew up in India, but I'm, I'm American. And why is it that you ask me? Did you ask that customer down there? Or did you ask my friend who's white? It could be a conversation starter. There's so much more I want to say, but I'll just stop there because I know Camille probably is dying to say things too. So I'll hand it over to you, Camille. It's so hard to follow, she <laughs> Um, she is somebody that I admire so much and um, am really inspired by, but these two boys, they are um, just sensational. And I am completely there with Shino about how they are so far ahead of their time. Um, 
as they were both telling stories, I was thinking about when I was their age and, and maybe a little younger. And um, my mother always used to say that the first word out of my mouth was why. And so I was a child who was very curious and wanted to understand why things were the way they were. And I got in a lot of trouble for that. <laughs> um, I was often silenced and, you know, didn't have the answers that I was looking for. And, um, you know, Shino used the word hope, and that was absolutely something that I was feeling listening to Jasper and Sunai. Um, it, it was um, something that I had held on to, a hope that I would find the answers I was looking for. Um, and, and it took a lot of years. Um, I mean, I did not find safe space for conversations until I was in college. Um, and even then, it was sometimes challenging. Um, and I think that a lot of this comes, um, you know, from from these systematic racist practices that had been put in place by redlining, and um, you know, and, and we see that still in our school system. Um, so I grew up in a mostly white affluent neighborhood. Um, but my parents were um, very young when they had me and we lived in a house, but it was a house that my grandparents owned. Um, and so, you know, you, you see how this intergenerational wealth plays itself out. And, and we're still seeing that today. And, um, and the school zones and the way they're set up are continuing segregation. So, you know, unless we're going to actively um, change admissions policies and really value uh, diversity and integration and inclusion, we're not going to see a lot of change. Um, you know, certainly not in, in the next few years. But um, I think that every little move that we make towards a more equitable society is making a change. And, and that's the hope that I'm hanging on to. <laughs> so um, I'm just so happy and excited to know that Jasper and Sunai are here um, doing this work. And you might hit a couple of walls along the way, but know that there are so many people who really want to see the world exist in your eyes, the way you're seeing it, the way you want to see it. Um, so I, you know, advice that I would give to you, if, if in some moments you're just feeling like this is so hard and I just don't, think I can do this anymore. Stop talking to the people you're talking to that are bringing you down and just like, you know, find a new group. And sometimes that's what we have to do. We have to just kind of like do a purge like a self-purge. And sometimes that happens in your closet and sometimes it happens to the, you know, the people you're surrounding yourself with. And, um, and you guys are amazing and I'm so glad to know you. I, I love what you said, Camille, is that you, you really have to think about the people you're surrounding yourself with and, and, uh, you know that 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 uh, is hard sometimes as a you know as a teenager as you guys are is to make those decisions of who you are friends with and who you aren't with. But fast forward to us 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 uh, uh, older folks, uh, you know we face some of those same journeys as well. Uh, we have a little bit more flexibility because our lives are a little bit more controlled and and we can do that. But I think you know all through life. Uh, you know, we, we're posed with these questions and even more so than ever, and ever. I mean, for a good part of my career, I would always get the question, and which is why I asked you today, it's like, oh, Neil, well, so Neil, where are you from? Where are your parents from? Where? And I, I love that, what you said, where are you really from? I, well, bed I grew up in Brooklyn. My parents grew up in Brooklyn. Well, how did you get out of bed -Stuy? 
um, B-52 bus, the A train, the GG, you know, the F train, you know, <laughs> so, you know, uh, the, these questions. Uh, oh, 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 that's right. Oh, my, my dad had a car too, right? So he could take me places, right? How amazing, right? Which, which is, you know, some of this uh, conversation that you, you take in stride, which is, again, I think what you and Jasper and Sine are doing as, as well. And, 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 and Gina, what advice uh, from your experiences you've been working with in your role, certainly in, in the, 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 the CEC in many ways, but also uh, what's your advice to, to the, this, the, the, these young, young men here and the other young men and women who are part of, of the change that we're seeing and, and how they keep the faith and keep, keep their drive forward and keeping the message going on on how change is needed? Um, I'm a firm believer in self-care. So you need to make sure you are well. And when I say you're well, it's not just your physical health, but it's your mind and soul, right? So make sure your mind, soul, body are in good condition because you cannot do this work if one of the three is out of whack. And when you're young, you may think you're invincible, you can do this, but even then, this is really taxing work. It's emotionally taxing, it's taxing on your soul, which, and if you're taxing your mind and soul and emotion, and then you're actually taxing your body too. So make sure to set aside time to do something that just makes you feel good, whatever that is. That's not part of this work, right? So you can't be watching like 13 or one of those really serious documentaries. You should do something that just is pure fun. Um, part of that, I'm a firm believer in nature therapy. Just go outside, hug a tree, go walk amongst the trees, go to a waterfront, stare at the water body, whatever it is. Huge boost to your three things that you need. Um, and I agree with Camille, get rid of people that you can't really be with, right? I, I, it's easier said than done, or at least limit your interactions with some of those people, even if they used to be your close friends. I think you really, that's part of taking care of your spiritual side and emotional side. And surround yourself with a lot of people who are doing this work as well. There is nothing like being in community with people who do the same work. That's a source of energy. And that's definitely what keeps me going. So kind of a wishy-washy new agey thing, but that's what I have to say. But I, I love it. I love it. I, I want to kind of wrap up what with kind of Sune and, and Jasper. Tell us, you know, how do you uh, get more students engaged? You know, what's your advice to them? What's your, your, your words to, to kind of get them to, to share in your, your experience? Uh, what advice would you have for them, Jasper? Well, you know, me and my mom, my mom makes, you know, she put me into the new three hours. I didn't have a choice, but, you know, I didn't want to either. I didn't, I didn't know the problems that were going on. So, you know, I was very happy about it once, once I had done it, but my my friends they all they're all you know, they're not they're not all terrible confederate loving people they're just they they get uncomfortable whenever i try to speak about it so you know my advice to them is just try it you know just do it do it for a couple of months, see if you like it or not, join a group. You know, I think really as much as it sounds like 
terrible parenting, just forcing your children to do something, just do it. It it will help them so much. It's, I cannot, you know, children, um, children only want fun. Um, yeah, that's about it. That That's all they want. That's why they don't like school. This is basically school and work combined. So it's the ultimate children destroyer. Um, but they are passionate and, you know, actually care about people. Then, you know, they'll enjoy it. They'll, because this isn't, this isn't, you know, the hard work. This is more, you know, education learning about uh, things so yeah just try it you know have your kids try it and if they if, if um if any of the kids want to try it for themselves ask their parents to sign them up it helps a lot thank you Jessa. so may what what advice do you have for your classmates and others who you uh you know should be you, you, that you might want to have them share your journey. What do you tell them? How do you get them engaged? What? To, why should they get involved in having these uncomfortable conversations? Yeah, that that's a great question. First of all, um, and yeah, like like Jasper, I thought the new three hours was going to be a book club. Um, so you know, I didn't know I was in for the you know ride of my life. But um, yeah, I think. Jasper spoke a lot to education and, and just doing it. And I feel like, yes, that's absolutely the, the first step, um, which is when I think of how do I get people to understand what the actual effects of racism are in our society? How do I get them to see that it's not just surface level, okay, so, you know, uh, this happened 300 years ago. It's all done. We swept it under the rug and we don't need to talk about it now. Um, and yes, education is absolutely the first step because I think each step leads into the other. Education, I feel, leads to some sort of empathy. Um, empathy leads to some sort of self realization, which means you're looking in the mirror and you're saying, okay. So what am I doing to actually uh, maybe actually benefit this, this whole systemic racism um, kind of agenda? And that is a hard conversation to have with yourself. Uh, and I think before you can have a conversation with anybody else and, and tell them how, how you're feeling, you need to understand how you're feeling first. Um, and that's i i know from experience that's a little bit hard for me to to look at because um of course i mean who would want to willingly admit to everybody that they're wrong or that they have some sort of bias in their mind that that makes them um kind of have preconceived notions about a certain group of people and when i when i recognize those those biases happening and when I did recognize those biases happening because of the, the way that I was brought up or you know whatever media I was uh, kind of exposed to growing up then I, I try to stop myself and think and recognize that yes this is happening what do you think triggered it and how can we avoid it in the future <clears throat> excuse me so yes empathy um, self-realization and I also think an education, um, but I also think in the sense of self-realization, people need to recognize their privilege and take a look at their privilege. And I think it's systemic racism is just so embedded in our society now. It's not just about the color of your skin anymore. It's become about your socioeconomic class and that kind of uh, protecting you or that, um, you know, kind of making you uh, 
maybe somehow you know half uh, white or you know some sort of uh, assimilation that every immigrant has to go through in order to become more American. So um, I think it, it's really important also to for people to look at their privilege and then if they can't look at their privilege, then it's my job to not remind them, but to open their eyes, whether that be in the form of um, poetry, whether that be in the form of information, whether that just be in the form of, hey, so let's talk about this, or what do you know about this? And um, I think those are those are the, the, the main things. And, and lastly, um, I think once you recognize that you have privilege or social standing, using it to your advantage to lead by example is really important because, you know, in a society where, where power is, is one of the, the key influences behind many of our decisions and the way we, we actually follow people, right? Um, why do you think there's such a large following of um, like the Confederate army? Uh, even to this day, it's been what, like two centuries since the Civil War. It all comes back to this one root issue of power. And once people recognize that they have that power, but they use it to their advantage instead of furthering um, their, their own class and stepping back and maybe giving up some of their privilege so that we can have a more equal society, then I think society itself can truly progress. Um, both as a whole and individually in our communities. Well said. I don't know what else to say after that. I think that was so well said. Uh, what a wonderful conversation. Uh, Jasper, Sune, you, know, you all uh, give us all great inspiration. Uh, I want to thank you for taking some time out of this this uh, this afternoon to join us for the conversation. I meant to moms, Camille and Sheena, you all are, are wonderful advocates. You're doing the hard work um, as parents as well as as uh, you know politically and and working through the the, the systems to raise awareness about uh, these equities and not being uh, uh, fearful about speaking up, which only helps provide greater inspiration for Sine and Jasper and the many other students, uh, you know, those who are involved in the three R's and those who are uh, working, walking in schools around the country, uh, trying to learn about each other, learn about themselves, understand the systems in which they're in, understanding and embracing their own identities, uh, under, uh, seeking better understanding about race, culture, and history. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful conversation. Uh, there's so much more to talk about and stay tuned to the Your Story is Our Stories podcast because we will have more of these conversations. Hi, I'm Dan Gore and welcome to this episode of Black History Fact. Today, I'm going to be speaking about Junius G. Groves. Junius George Groves, a successful self-educated former landowner and entrepreneur, became one of the most prosperous African-American men in the early 20th century. Born a slave on April 12, 1859 in Louisville, Kentucky, Junius George Grove relocated to Kansas at the age of 19 as an exoduster. He worked at the meatpacking houses in Armadale and later moved to Edwardsville. Here, Groves purchased 90 acres of land and began to raise white potatoes. His business prospered and he became known as the potato king of the world because he reportedly grew more bushels of potato per acre than anyone else in the world. He also bought and shipped potatoes, seed potatoes, and other produce, as well as owning a store in Edwardsville and having numerous other business interests. 
The Union Pacific Railway built a special spur to his property to accommodate his needs. He was a founding member of the Kansas State Negro Business League, the Caw Valley Potato Association, the Sunflower State Agricultural Association, and the Pleasant Hill Baptist Church Society. He was featured in Booker T. Washington's book, The Negro Business in 1907. At the height of his success, he owned more than 500 acres. Groves and his wife, Matilda, built a 20 room mansion, which featured the latest comforts of the day, electricity, hot and cold running water, and telephones. In the early 1900s, he founded the community of Groves Center near Edwardville, selling small tracts of land to African-American families. He also built a golf course for African-Americans, possibly the first such course in the country. Junius Groves died in Edwardsville in 1925. I'm Danny Gore, and this has been this episode of Black History Fact. Thanks for joining.